maintaining InDesign at this point. Um, I think we're also going to jump to defining some character styles as well. Please let me know if you have some issues looking for the character styles. And uh, if you do, it's in the same exact spot, text or window, style, cell style, character style. Nope. Oh, I turned it off. Okay, then you can see where it goes. Character style. There it is. And this kind of follows the same formula that we were looking at before. The issue is that you have a couple less options because now we're just looking at finding things on a word basis as opposed to a whole paragraph. This does bring up one option though. So I know that um, my body text is Roboto Light. I can put in Roboto here, but if I were to remove that and just say, oh, well, it should be italic. Let's actually apply that to some text. Does anybody see an issue with just saying this should be italic? It's kind of a visual thing. Yeah, it does look bold, right? And that's because Roboto has all these different weights to it. And this might be something that you see. So we need to say, we need to be a little bit more specific. You might see this too. Mm -hmm. Right, it has to be light italic. Uh, I bring this up because you may see in your books sort of automatically generated um, italic style. So you, if you have a sidebar, if you have boxes and it has italic in it, that's fine in Word. It can just be italic because we're just rendering it as normal. Once again, it's an InDesign though. We, from experience, know that you can have typefaces that are that don't have an italic. They have what's called an oblique, or maybe they have, you know, uh, weights not um, indicated by words but by um, numbers. Like the first typeface I looked at, Uzio Sam, that just has a 100, a 300, and it has a 100 oblique, 300 oblique. So sometimes we may need to be a little bit more specific. I may need to say, well, this is actually light italic and then it's corrected. This could cause some issues later on. Um, so you may need to have what are called alt styles. We'll get into that a lot next week, but there are gonna be these things that we introduce in typesetting that allow you to be a little bit more flexible and still maintain our standards. All right, one other major topic I wanna to talk about here, um, that only looks a little tight, this book, like, not a lot of words on the page. It's pretty dense. So we're going to adjust the margin of the book. We could have done that when we made um, the file. We could have said, hey, I want my margins to look like this. But we also have the option to do it later on. Um, and it gets into the difference between pages, what are called pages, and master pages. Master pages basically contain all the rules for pages that have that master applied to them. So rather than selecting a certain page and adjusting its margins, well, I want to adjust all the pages margins. So I double click this A master here. If you guys need to find that, again, just like all the other ones, it's under window, pages. I'm going to press W. And that brings up all the little sort of mechanical aspects of the page. Uh, this red line here is the bleed. Here's my margins. And I want to make these, you know, the margins a little wider. So the text box is a little bit more readable. So that's under layout, margins and columns. And I'm also gonna make sure I have this option click enable layout adjustment. That's a very handy option because that's going to adjust the margins and the text boxes on those pages. So that let's say your designer goes through and makes these adjustments. They don't have to then go back and adjust to all the pages. And we can just start talking about some different things here. Top margins, I'll just say, I want all the margins to be one inch. I can do that, it starts to look kind of okay. I click this little box, this little link box, so that they're all even, but we might not want that. So I'm gonna unclick it. Um, our bottom margin, you might want that to be a little wider, a little larger. Maybe we wanna put you know, our running head down here like it was in the example. 
maybe I don't, maybe I want my running head in the top. So I'm going to sort of flip those by entering half an inch. Now we have some space for the running header up here. Maybe in our, like in our example, I want really wide margins. I think, um, you know, Karen, you indicated that like white margins are pretty nice. A lot of white space, looks attractive. There's space for us to put um, images, captions, sidebars in the margins if we have enough space there. So I'm gonna go to this outside margin here and call it like, what it's called, go crazy, three inches. Really big. <laughs> um, it's a little ridiculous, but let's go down to two. You can do a little bit of math sometimes here. If I, maybe I like that shape, but I want to pull it away from the gutter a little bit. Well, then I can just increase this by, like that 1.5, this 1.5. Let me kind of move it out a little bit. And I think I like it a little higher on the page. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I kind of like it the way it was before. Oops. Um, nope. And two. We can kind of go to something like that, I think. Um, one issue that we can get into here, depending on how large your book is, this comes up when we do Bibles, for example. I'll just say, okay, for now. Depending on how large your book is, and with textbooks, this is kind of an option. You may want to watch how large this inner gutter is, because if your book is gigantic and you go to turn the page, maybe all of a sudden that, like, creep is a little bit big and all of a sudden you have things disappearing into the margin because of the way the paper folds so you might want to look at making sure that that's not like you know half an inch or something like that right now all of a sudden once the book gets into higher page numbers this text text starts to sort of disappear into the fold because we're not going to crack the book in half and lay it flat there's going to be this little curve to it i'll change that back to one let me go back here now, because I use that layout adjustment option, everything sort of, uh, all the text boxes are the correct size as well. It starts to look very formal to me so far with all the sand sticker text, white space, black text. It's pretty, and pretty serious. Questions and observations so far. Good to go. I hope I hope that it's helpful to at least you know, see the decision process there. You know, like a if we went way back to the beginning of when we flowed in the InDesign book, it, it's unreadable. Everything's the same exact look to it. So what we're doing is really just an extension of that differentiation process. Uh, Richard, to answer your question, to answer your question, describe create formal design templates ahead of page makeup, or is design or is design done on the fly? Hmm. At least, well, I'll answer that question, then you tell me if I'm actually answering your question. So I would say that much of it is done. If it's an original new project, a lot of it's done like this. There's a discussion that happens beforehand that addresses those questions I talked about earlier. You know, what's your demographic? What do you want out of this book? Are there features that you're interested in uh, exploring in the design? You know, like wide margins. Um, otherwise, we sort of, it's this kind of organic sort of look at the book and experimenting with things. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, so maybe we want to try a design that has these margins, try out a different design, have a design that explores these page options, and then another one that maybe, you know, looks at what does it look like if it's a two column design or something like that. Does that, does that improve things? Does it make things worse? But there are other projects where maybe, um, you know, there, there might be a client that says, hey, I really like that other book that you did for us and we're looking for something similar. Or if it's a template project, we still do a design sample because even if we have a template already, the template may not have all the elements in the book. You can have a book that is just plain text and block quotes, and then all of a sudden book three, now this author put in sidebars. Well, now we need to make a design that matches, you know, a design of the sidebars that matches the rest of the book, and then show what that looks like in the sample and get it approved by the client and the author. So I think, so we do still get that from outside clients. We don't do it internally. And I think a lot of those, you know, rules that you mentioned are, are in, in the file, but they're defined through the paragraph style. 
So not only are we defining just like the look of things, but we're defining the behavior of stuff. And that's done through master pages, different master pages as well. So like your chapter title sync is like very likely defined because your chapter opener page is a different master page and it has a sync that goes down to here or something. Mm -hmm. So just in the sort of execution of the template, you get through, you get those rules just as a result. The designer isn't, and the typesetter isn't responsible for verifying that there's so much space here because we've already built it into the behavior of that style. Okay. Yeah, but we still, we still get that from publishers who, you know, kind of like the examples files that I sent where names of styles run one layer, they'll have, you know, P and P is Adobe Garamond and it is 11 over 17 and it hyphens after two and things like that. Yeah. Okay, so other than kind of continuing to walk through the design, which I can still do if people are interested in, I don't have too much for us this week, so we can talk more about what we're going to look at next week and what we'll need to have for next week as well. Okay. So I'm happy to, if anyone sees anything that they want to talk about specifically, please let me know. Or if there's any InDesign question they have, I can answer that. But for the most part, we're pretty much done a little bit early today, so I hope that's okay. Um, and then we'll just talk about, hooray. <laughs> um, and then we'll just talk about things for next week. And I'll stop sharing as well. I'll wait for a second. Okay, so I'm just going to download everything then. Download tools. Download DTD. This means I'll have to, I'll have to reinstall my super secret scribe version uh, with all of our cool experimental stuff. So, so I've downloaded those two things. I'll go to my downloads folder. I'm not getting ahead of myself. And I'm just going to unzip these two folders. So the CTDs and the InDesign tools. For the InDesign tools, this is the folder that we'll need, the one that says scribe tools inside the InDesign tools folder. We're not concerned about these right now. We're just concerned about this one. In the other folder, the DTDs, we're concerned about that SAM DTD. So I'm actually going to put it somewhere. I know it will live forever because I know I'll need it every single time I need to refer to it. So you can actually see it's already in my documents folder. So I'm just going to put them in there and get replaced and replaced. So if you've got like a scribe stuff folder somewhere, maybe that your um, FAI tools live, that's a good place to keep it. Just something that's not going to move around because it needs to live in a kind of permanent spot because it's going to be referred to. Okay. And now the other thing I'm going to do is the tool operates uh, by using different um, scripts, essentially. It's put into this nice handy menu, but what we need to do is we need to locate where the scripts live. And that's under Window, Utilities, and Scripts. And it should open up a window somewhere. Oh, there it is. It's behind your faces. OK. So this might look a little different. You might see something like applications and users. Um, you might see Apple scripts, things like that. Um, but what we need to do is we need to locate this user folder in the architecture of your computer, take that scribe tools folder, and then put it into that. InDesign makes this really handy because we can just click reveal. It might say, Elvis, you can let me know if it's different on PC for Mac users. It'll just say reveal in Finder. And it'll open up a brand new window exactly that says a scripts panel. And on PC, it's reveal in Explorer. So it's the same okay. uh, setup. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll just repeat that real quick. So I need to go to Window, Utilities, Scripts. And that opens that little scripts tool or scripts palette in InDesign. And I need to find out where this user folder lives in the full in the in my computer. So I go to click this little top drop down button and say reveal. And it opens up a window. And the window that it opens up is what I need to drag my scribe tools folder into. 
I'll just move these over here. So just to make it clear, here's my design. Here's my download folder. Here's my InDesign folder with the scripts panel. I'm going to go to that tool download folder, grab the one called scribe tools and just drag it over here. For you guys, it shouldn't have to replace anything because it should probably be the first time this is happening, but I'm going to say replace. So next thing we want to do is we just want to double click this SCR install JavaScript file. Hooray. Um, and then you should get a little pop-up that says installation successful, restart in design. After you restart, that's when you should see the scribe tools menu. I'm do that right now. Don't need that. We'll just see how long it takes my computer to restart in design. Yeah. And then hopefully everybody should have a new menu item that says scribe tools and the drop down available. These things we're going to walk through uh, what they do next week when we talk about the granular typesetting side of things. Um, but for now, I just want to make sure that everyone has it.